Well, I came to Vancouver in 78, in fact, moved into the West End, not too far from where we are. Ran for council in 86, very fortunate, good timing, and served for 15 years. And then with equally good timing, <laughs> chose not to run in 2002. Right. So now I'm a consultant. <laughs> <laughs> so um, your background before that, were you, what sort of work did you do before you were a city council? Well, I was a real hodgepodge, uh, basically an editor-writer. But I also served as a consultant to the city on West End issues. People might remember the whole Shane the John Street prostitution problem was involved in that. Yeah. Helped establish AIDS Vancouver. So it was a, an interesting combination of um, social planning and to some degree housing issues. That's one thread that you can pull and you find is connected to everything else. So, uh, but you're not a... a Builder or a no. uh, planner? Well, the great thing about council is it's like one ongoing grad seminar. You're constantly briefed, and it's a tremendous education. Wouldn't pretend to be a specialist in any one area, but uh, I'd argue from the experience you end up being a generalist. Well, let's break it out because right away you're going to have to deal with something more specific than the general question of housing. Just too many factors involved in that. Uh, Look, there's one fundamental reality for this place. It's bounded very tightly, perhaps more than any other urban region in North America. Possible exception to places like San Francisco or Manhattan Islands, in other words. In a, in a way, we are an island. We're bounded by the mountains and the water, the border. We've decided wisely that we're going to put our agricultural land in a preserve. We've dramatically limited the amount of land that we can expand out onto. In fact, as far as the city of Vancouver is concerned, our ability to redevelop on greenfield sites, vacant land, ended sometime really in the 1970s. And since then, it's been a constant dilemma of how to infill, to add density, to rebuild, to rezone, to add floor space. But the option of building on land has vanished. And that puts immense pressure, just immense pressure, on a city. So, uh, what, uh, what do you think is is driving this need for infill and and uh, uh, reuse and uh, and changing the change in the city? More people, limited amount of space, upward pressure on costs in every aspect, and so uh, you look for as many ways as you can to meet an insatiable demand. Mm -hmm. Oh, and one other thing. As people get more affluent, they like space. <laughs> and and uh, to complicate it even more, the family size has dropped. So you have to actually provide more space to house the same or even less people. Let's take the West End. A uh, good example. In 1956, when it was rezoned for high-rise, there was about 22,000 people living west of Burrard Street. And the highest building was the Sylvia Hotel. Used to be a sign up there that said, Down in the Sky. And then we unleashed the development boom of the 1970s, and really everything over five stories that you see in the West End today uh, was built between 62 and 72. So we quintupled the housing stock, in other words, five times as many units as there was before the start of the boom. And at the end of it, the population had reached all of 37,500, which is what it is today. Now think about it. Housing stock went up five times. Yeah. Population didn't even double. Yeah. What happened? Uh, Jane Jacobs uh, describes it, I think, accurately when she says, people confuse overcrowding and high density. Overcrowding is too many people in too small a space. It's what they want to get out of when they have options. But they may choose a high density neighborhood if it provides them with what they need, and generally that means more space. So what happened was the West End uncrowded. People who were living in a garret or a basement suite or were sharing in a basically a rooming house now had a 750 square foot apartment, you know, a little balcony out front, sliding glass door, new appliances, and one unit for themselves. It was the perfect timing because uh, the baby boomers were just coming out of the suburbs. And so here we had created an ideal environment for them. But look at the West End today. Imagine it compared to the day when the Sylvia was the highest building. And all of these high rises, people think it's the densest residential area in Canada, which it isn't, but certainly is in Vancouver. And yet we simply accommodated, what, about another twenty to 30,000 people. 
That's one year's growth in the lower mainland today. Here's another way of looking at it. Uh, take everything that's been built on the downtown peninsula since 1986, since Expo. Mm -hmm. All those high rises, mm -hmm. Coal Harbor, Concord, City Gate, Downtown South, what we call Triangle West, all of it. And, and add in everything that's going to be built on those lands for about the next 15 years. And we will have probably have accommodated maybe about another mm, 50, 60,000 people. Well, that's about maybe two to three years growth in the lower mainland. After all of that, so so we've got a uh, um, a huge. I see. So there's a growth, a straight population growth, and the population's changing also. Oh yeah, kinds of people, people come living. from everywhere. It's a great place to live. Yeah, they keep telling us, you know, number one, number two, maybe <laughs> most livable city in the world. Well, sure, economically healthy, attractive, stable, with a very high standard of living. Of course, it's going to attract people. Yeah, the, the demo. The demographics of the people that are coming to the city, will they all want to live downtown or oh, where no. else will they go in the no, city? No, no, in fact, just a very small percentage. A lot of people, but a small percentage. And most, for at least to the foreseeable future, will choose some kind of suburban option. Now, it'll be an increasingly higher density suburban option, but not nothing compared to the West End or the downtown peninsula. And that's good because it gives them a range of choices. It may be, in fact, a high density, high rise neighborhood in somewhere like Lonsdale. Or it might be the traditional single-family house, but if the expectation is is that everyone is going to live more or less as they did or had expectations of living in the post-war period, that's not on. So what what do you th what are those expectations? Those previous Space. expectations, and what do you think that's Space. changing to? Space. Look, it's a human thing. There isn't a culture that I'm aware of that doesn't like to have more space. And, and that can even include an area like the West End. I mean, you know, um, you, you, the condominiums get bigger than the traditional small apartment that might have been the norm in the 1960s. You look at what's happening in heritage areas uh, frequently. In fact, we were doing a tour of Grandview yesterday, and you see the signs that houses that serve the function they did in the West End in the 1940s and 50s when they were boarding houses are now being restored to single family purpose and the single family is probably less people than it traditionally would have been as well. So a neighborhood can actually lose population even if nothing else changes. In other words, uh, here's, the <laughs> here's the worst case scenario from a planner's point of view. You can actually go to a lot of trouble to increase density and still find you've lost population. That happened in back in Vancouver in the 1970s. And, and that was uh, people they just they weren't willing to to live in the spaces that were uh, no they continued to live in the spaces mm -hmm. the families that grew up in the 1950s yeah. the mom dad and the 2.3 kids mm -hmm. well the 2.3 kids moved on maybe to the west end mom dad stayed in the same big house uh you know with the two or three bedrooms mm -hmm. and and that's where the population drop occurred when the baby boomers uh, were first moving out of those suburban houses in the 1960s and 70s so it's a real conundrum from a, a planning point of view. You can spend a lot of political capital to try and increase density, but if you translate that only as floor space, it may not address the population demand. So, okay, so we're still dealing with the broad issues. We're talking about the population growing and increasing in a confined, narrow area. Maybe you can address the issue of affordability. What well, is the affordability uh, problem? That one of those to? ability words. Ability, yeah. <laughs> Livability, affordability. Tell me what it is. What is affordability? I think it's five hundred dollars less than what you're paying. <laughs> That's my definition. <laughs> Take five hundred bucks off my mortgage yeah. or my rent, and you know, you've got it. You got affordability. It's too relative a term. I often find that when people are comparing housing prices in Vancouver, you can pretty much assume that what's in their head is a single-family house, right? They're saying it's not affordable to live in Vancouver. Well, first of all, tell me your income. Right? We've got to start with that. Yeah. I need to know your income. And then I have to know what your expectations are. If you, if you have, say, a middle a median income in, in Vancouver, and we know precisely what that is, is because it's what we pay our city councillors. <laughs> so it's between forty and fifty thousand. Um, and you want to buy a single family house in a nice neighborhood with good schools, and you say it's just not possible for me, that's correct. However, uh, the housing standard is no longer the single family house. Mm 
if you have an expectation that that's what you're entitled to, and there is a sense of entitlement, I'll tell you why in a bit, uh, then no, there's no way you can meet that standard of quote affordability because the premise is right away unrealistic. Now, is it affordable to buy, say, a condominium, a townhouse? Depending on the neighborhood, that might be perfectly within range, particularly of a young person starting out, possibly. Remember, about 58, I believe, percent of Vancouverites are actually renters. So maybe we're talking rents here, and again, that's going to vary depending very much on the form and location of the accommodation. So it's very tricky. What people really mean is that Vancouver is an expensive place to live for housing as a percentage of your income. And that's a reflection, obviously, of the relentless pressure, the demand pressure, that comes up against, once people are established in a neighborhood, their unwillingness to fundamentally see it change. No one that I can ever recall came up to City Hall and said, Hi there, would you help us change the fundamental character of our community? <laughs> well, so that uh, and so these two questions of affordability and, and population change, it does come to this question of neighborhood change. What, oh, cool. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, That's why in the 1980s it was, uh, for at least this period of time, it was a, a, a real achievement to take industrial areas that had no pre-existing housing that either had to be fundamentally changed or demolished. Oh my gosh. Shift people out, you know, create the trauma that happened in the West End in the 1960s. Uh, we were able to take really vacant parcels of land. If you look at where they are, they're basically along waterfronts, so right away they had high amenity. Fraser Lands, for instance, along the Fraser, uh, Concord, Coal Harbor. And a few industrial parcels, one of which went actually very smoothly, which was Collingwood Village uh, along Choice Station. There's a neighborhood, actually, I would say is maybe the exception, that was real willing to take significant change. And then one that wasn't, uh, Arbutus, the Arbutus um, development in Kitsilano. Tremendous resistance. Even though the land was effectively vacant from a residential point of view, the neighborhood was highly resistant in seeing anything that they thought was out of character. So uh, neighborhood resistance, uh, uh, it's quite understandable in, in many respects. Um, if you've created a high quality of life, why do you want to see anyone come in and change it, particularly if you're the one who has to pay, either in terms of the character of your community or increased density, for someone who's going to gain a profit, both the developer and the person who buys? And, and you know, the, the people don't say it. There's another kind of way of thinking about it. If there's a shortage of supply, it means the existing housing stock increases in value. Well, if you've been there for a while, that's capital appreciation, which goes to your bottom line. And if you've paid off your mortgage, my gosh, that's people's uh, retirement. They are looking now at their housing as um, basically their ticket to security. And for someone to come in and say the intent of, of our housing policy is actually going to be to lower the price to make it more affordable of your house is not a message that they want to hear. So affordability is also, uh, there's a lot of people that resist this question of, of wanting to see the value of property go down or stabilize in any case. People who do own property want to see the value go up. That's human. So, sounds very human. That's so, what makes the secondary suite issue so interesting over time. From, we've gone, in fact, uh, really quite an extraordinary story from tremendous resistance, just a flashpoint. Uh, you can get, you would get hundreds of people out to community meetings if you even breathed the word that you were going to uh, legalize secondary suites to what happened just a few weeks ago, where with almost without comment, uh, effectively a council was able to legalize suites. Now, I think what happened, I'm, I'm sure there's a number of reasons. What, yeah, what has happened? Well, I think uh, I can think of two or three things. There's been enough change, uh, people moving out, capitalizing their houses, and the people who've come in have recognized that they're going to have to have the secondary suite as a mortgage helper. Now, the dilemma of that is it will generally increase land values, uh, housing costs. It's what happened when women started to work uh, in order to, you know, have a better way of life. They added more income to the household, but as a consequence, the cost of housing went up to absorb what became an available amount of money that people could pay. I think that somewhat the same thing may well happen with secondary suites once they're legalized. They will become the norm because it will simply be too unaffordable to have a house without it except for a few.
Uh, now, what will happen to rents as a consequence of that remains to be seen, but it, it may not be the solution that a lot of housing advocates think it will be. What it will do is a very gentle form of densification. In other words, it will begin to restore to what uh, looks on the surface to be a traditional single-family house to actually the density, the number of people in the house, that it would have been typical for the time it was built, maybe in the 20s, 30s, 40s. You have a household with maybe only two people in it, and they put in a secondary suite. That might be the equivalent of a normal family that would have lived there in the up to the 1950s. So we may just take our neighborhoods back to the densities at which they were planned for. So the uh, it may become the norm uh, and very gentle densification. And this is a kind of densification that uh, mom and dad can do to their own house. It doesn't require a big developer to roll in and put up 300 units right. of, of new stock. This is something that can happen in the neighborhoods now. Right. And the, the real dilemma will be uh, accommodating the car. That's not so gentle form of densification. So all those people are going to come with cars. Well, a lot of Pretty people much. don't have cars, though. Well, uh, yeah, but watch what happens. Okay, well, I mean, there's certain transit solutions that can be... Uh, to, uh, hey, when you didn't well. have a legal suite and the flashpoint with your neighbor was parking, right? People had a real incentive not to intrude with the car. You legalize all of that. Look, we are, we are richer people than we tend to acknowledge when it comes to the car. There's almost no one who really, uh, if they live in a situation where the car is a necessary form of transportation, I'm not talking about areas where transit is good enough so that it's a real, real choice for people not to have one, like the West End. Uh, that's going to be a, a dilemma. Look to cities like San Francisco. <laughs> I remember talking to a planner there and saying, what's your three top problems? He says, well, the first is parking. The second, parking. Third, parking. Right. Right. And it's because of the density in, in downtown San Francisco. Well, that's right, but you're going to see some of the same issues, too. So, Car is insatiable no. leader of space. So, well, so uh, we're back to space. So, um, I mean, do you think uh, the secondary suites as a method of, of uh, transformation of our neighborhoods, what, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily hinge on space except for parking because we're maintaining the same housing structure and housing form, but do you think um, uh, that, that it changed the social nature of communities by sure. having uh, tenants oh, where it used to be single family homes, where presumably they were more stable or stayed or something, uh, yeah, you know, but they'd be more transient renters. And yeah, it might there's a lot of value judgments that come with that. Um, people are always in transition. This is a society that talks on one hand of uh, an ideal of community where people live their lives in the same neighborhood. Hardly anybody does that. <laughs> We're always in transition. Uh, we raise our kids. Okay, that's a maybe 20-year process. Right? It's a very small percentage of your life. Important, critical. Then what? Well, the kids move on. Maybe they go to university. Terrific. They're there for five years. That's when they're in a secondary suite, perhaps. Then they move on uh, into, what, their first house? Well, condominium in this city. They want to get into the housing market. They purchase a small unit. Maybe they raise a toddler there. Okay, maybe that's another five years of their life. Then they move on to something. Now they're in the capital. They get some capital appreciation. They buy a larger place. Maybe they finally buy their dream home just about the time when the kid moves out of the house. <laughs> right, so you get these kind of McMansions uh, yeah. with four or five bedrooms for people who just got to the point where the kids leave the house. Never understood that one. Uh, and then they look around and said, my God, we've got to cut the grass and I don't know who vacuums these places. That's what I've often wondered. And then they say, hey, maybe it's time to sell the big place and why don't we buy that condo down in Coal Harbor now that we can afford it. All right, and so they move, they downsize. Everybody shifts. And there's a lot of points where that shift occurs where transitional housing is really key. It's one of the functions that the West End's always provided. About 80, 85% of it is rental. And people have often used that as a negative. But you'll often hear the story um, from people who first came to Vancouver or went through a transition in their life where they lived in the West End and they will associate it with one of the happier periods. In a sense, they were freed from the obligation that comes with making the commitment to home ownership. Now, they only saw it as a transition, but fine. Uh, we had a place to accommodate them. So, so societies that don't have places for transition 
uh, have problems uh, accommodating those people who have that need. And at one point in our lives, we're all in transition. So, okay, you've said for us that a big uh, number of challenges facing Vancouver now. Um, but we really, we really have to address the question of solutions. I mean, realistic solutions to this. Sure. Uh, you've looked at, uh, you've said, just as secondary suites is going to be a suitable tool to uh, to accommodate that. Well, look, let's start with one premise here. There's no solution to affordability because affordability is too big a term. It sets expectations up that almost guarantee failure. If people's what they have in their head is that the city should somehow find a solution to affordability which translates into going back to a period when you could afford a single family house and you define that whether you stated it or not as the affordability challenge you lose right <laughs> you're not going to do that right. or or you're going to say basically we're back in the sprawl business we're going to open up a lot of cheap land i could solve that problem tomorrow i'll just simply write off the agricultural land reserve okay you let me do that, and I'll get you just a flood of cheap land that I can service at relatively low cost that will bring down that cost of fundamental affordability, land, service land. Right? If you let me build freeways, if you can give me the money for it, let's get it from the feds to open up a lot of that land up the valley right? that gives people relatively fast movement throughout the region for a brief period, into, I'll guarantee you. I'll drive down the cost of land. If you're prepared to give me that, I can solve affordability. Now, I don't think we are. And so in which case, you've put in place a premise that cannot be met. <laughs> don't set yourself up for failure. Now, so let's look at the, once we've got the affordability thing out of the way here. Okay. <laughs> what you're really asking, I think, is how can we broaden the range of choices for people? That's it. Well, do we have to broaden the range of choices? I you bet, because if you've eliminated the one kind of mark that everyone has used as a definition of affordability, the single-family house on its own lot, now you've got to offer people a, a much broader range to meet their various needs at various times in their life. One, one solution no longer works because you can't, you can't provide it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really, you know, the fundamental difference when I look at American and Canadian cities it's in the American city, the norm is still the single family house. You will find most people that, uh, once they're in the housing market, are, are basically looking for that. Well, you're talking about the American suburb. The American that's pretty much all there is yeah. in the American well, city. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. that's the standard they set for themselves, and they've been remarkable at being able to meet it for so long, except in cities that are just so limited by geography. Yeah. Yeah. But even in places like that, in the Bay Area and San Francisco, they're sprawling into the Central Valley. It's a concept of space, isn't it, that people are calling for. It. You bet. That it's a certain worldview about space. One kind of space. One kind of space. So presumably, if we talk about uh, making different choices in Vancouver, we're talking about uh, using space differently or um, mm -hmm. uh, sharing space, perhaps, in a way that was considered private before. Or, but um, can you, can you That's think a tough sell. Can you think of specific examples in the city of where people are using space better? They're living in one. Here we are, downtown. downtown. Uh, yeah, we have about a thousand square feet here in a nine-story building in one of the densest parts of the West End. So it sure meets my needs. Now, no children, because you're, you're inevitably you're quickly going to get back to that. Yeah, but you can't raise kids here. A, you can, and the schools are a testament to that. Okay. School schools? Well, that's... So our director of planning, Larry Beasley, has said if you're going to compete with the suburbs, you have to offer everything that they provide plus what the city can offer. So that's clean, green, safe, and good schools. And if you do, people may well choose it as their first choice. And people are used to living in high-density environments, which, by the way, is most of the world for most of human history, <laughs> that people have been living in cities. You know, we've had this fairly brief moment when the norm could be considered to be low-density sprawl. Uh, you've got to offer them uh, uh, those choices so that, yes, you can raise kids. It's possible to do it. Um, but more importantly is to offer them those range of choices that they need at all these different points in their lives. And then, rather than mom and dad having to live in a single-family house after the kids have moved out, they're much more likely to move to something that may better suit their needs, better designed and smaller, so that they free up that critical housing where people may make their first choice to raise their kids, 
But if you've got these locked-in neighborhoods, this is particularly true in the North Shore, uh, where mom and dad aren't going to move out, first of all, they don't want to, and there's very little available in their neighborhood to move to, the huge capital stock of appropriate housing for a different demographic is not available to them. So uh, when you look around the city, I mean, uh, you look at the brewery site, Arbutus Walk, yep. um, uh, that would seem to have certain compelling uh, advantages. Uh, in fact, it can easily be a car-free uh, living there, mm -hmm. uh, given the transit and the services that are nearby. Right. Um, do you, uh, anything else you found particularly appealing? Well, I'll tell you the story about what happened when we had our, our housing crisis in the 1980s. Now, some will remember that uh, because of the pressure, developers are going in and demolishing three-story buildings, particularly in Carisdale in the apartment district there. Well, oh, man, that was brutal. You were evicting, you know, elderly women in particular who had been living there for decades in a neighborhood they loved. Uh, demolishing those buildings, building high-rise condominiums with less units. You can see maybe a 15-story building that goes up one suite per floor replacing a low-rise apartment building that had 30 units. I've seen examples in the West End, the Sylvia Hotel extension. It's about 20 stories. There used to be a three-story walk-up on that site that had something like uh, 30 units in it. So you saw a uh, stock of affordable housing that was being rented by a critical and vulnerable part of your population being replaced with luxury housing that was, by most people's definition, way unaffordable. Bad combination. Created a political dynamic where people were demanding solutions to the housing crisis. And what the planners did was to pull out all the reports that they had written for the previous housing crisis that didn't get passed because, as these things tend to do, they work themselves out, takes the political pressure off, and then you go on to the next issue. So one afternoon down at Robson Square, we passed, <laughs> my recollection is about, you know, a dozen different policies that were all meant to try and address the housing crisis. And I can remember two or three of them that really stand out. One was in Triangle West, this area just to the west, basically, of Thurlow Street, where we had expected that the downtown business district would continue to expand basically between George and Hastings, where it comes to a point there. He said, basically, you can take the same density, but rather than building a commercial office tower, you can build a condominium. Now, these are very large, highest density buildings we ever built. No objection. First of all, the market loved the idea. Secondly, if they did build a high-rise tower, it seemed to fit in with what the urban form was there anyway. We weren't displacing anybody, and we were offering that high-rise condominium that would otherwise go into neighborhoods that would complain. Second thing, uh, we took away a disincentive to build residential along the trolley lines, the old streetcar lines, 4th Avenue, Broadway, Kingsway, Commercial Drive, so that now you could build maybe three or four stories of residential above a strip shopping development. Actually, it's the way that human beings have been developing urban areas for generations. And overnight, again, you saw a densification along the trolley lines. There was transit, there was the shopping, there was an additional amount of housing that could go into a neighborhood, but not not in the single family or duplex or low-rise areas. So it was much more accepted. There were the industrial lands, the so-called let-go lands, places like Arbutus Gardens, uh, Collingwood Village. There was, fourthly, of course, the mega-project opportunities. Uh, the deindustrialization of the city. False Creek used to be our industrial basin. Now starting in the 1970s when the city acquired the South Shore, demonstrated that it was possible to do at a higher density, but not high-rise. I mean, everyone was agreed after the building of the West End, no more high-rises. You could do it and attract families with children. Revolutionary. And so by the time we got to the late 80s, when the housing crisis had come back again, we were able to return to an urban form, this time condominium, that had previously been rejected because we had design control. We were providing amenities parks, schools, daycare. We were meeting the demand clearly that the market said existed, and we were taking pressure off the existing neighborhood. If you walk the streets of the West End today, here it is, 2004 March, and you're going to see building after building will have a for rent sign out front. I mean, a few months ago, every building had a vacancy sign. Now, that hasn't happened in memory in the West End. What happened? Well, all the development in downtown South. Renters who were looking at what it would cost with low interest rates, 
to put the money down for a mortgage, found it was roughly equal to what they were paying in rent. They were into the housing market. They were getting new accommodation, and that counts for a lot. New appliances, plumbing that works. So they just said, we're out of here. And amazingly, uh, they took the pressure off the West End to the point where rents have even started, in some cases, to go down. So you ask the question of affordability. If you supply enough that meets at least a part of the market niche, you'll take pressure off your existing housing stock that would otherwise be competed for by people who do have options, more income, and will displace those who don't. And if that happens all the way down your housing market, the people who get the shot out of the bottom end up on the street. Now, unfortunately, you know, it only happens for a while. Again, go back to the numbers. We are accommodating maybe another 20,000 people in downtown South. Great, we've accommodated one year's growth in the lower mainland. Brutal. But, I mean, the bright side is, is that it's a niche. It's only part of the market. And it was came on stream fast enough to take the pressure off the West End, which might have gone into another housing crisis. Now, what it's done is freed up um, less valuable, older housing stock, even to the point now where people are concerned that, that it's beginning to decay and they're trying to think of maybe ways that we should be increasing value so that the West End doesn't uh, begin to get too, quote, slummy. Don't think that's going to be a big problem. Uh, what do you think of the homelessness problem in Vancouver? Well, it's, again, one of these uh, really profoundly difficult issues because it becomes connected with so many other issues, uh, drugs. Uh, but the one thing that I think was just a dramatically bad mistake that we made, just awful, and I don't know why we did it, was to shut down Riverview. Now, uh, I'm sure if you talk to people who were advocates of that, they had their reasons for not wanting to warehouse the mentally ill. Their expectation is that they would be served better in their community. And indeed, if the resources had been applied to the degree that would have justified that policy, it might not have been a mistake. But the result was is that they ended up in the worst possible environment. The streets of the downtown east side, subject to, of course, all of the, the problems that emerged that we've seen played out. And for mentally ill people with multiple addictions, um, and we just, we, and why we did it, I don't know, because the Americans had done it first and we should have known better. So, uh, is that, uh, when, when was that Riverview decision? It's still ongoing. It's, but it's, still uh, I think it was one of those curious um, points where both the left and the right saw what they thought was uh, a strategy that met their own agendas. Um, but phew, what a mistake. Uh, the uh, government's getting out of uh, targeted housing programs. Again, just really complicated things. And it doesn't take the presence of too many people out on the street to have a big impact socially, particularly as neighborhoods um, go through their own changes. So I think the, you know, you again provide the support services that are going to be needed uh, to try and reach people who can be reached. Uh, you recognize as well that there are probably some that you won't, and that will be a human tragedy. Primarily a health care solution to oh, this? It's going to be multiple. It's one of the reasons it? why it's so difficult to do, because it involves different agencies trying to coordinate um, with the resources necessary, and there's significant resources involved Deep with multiple levels of government. Remember that housing is an ecology, that people tend to sort it all out and apply different policies um, without recognizing that one policy there will have an influence all the way through that ecology of housing. And often won't want to admit that it does. Housing advocates in particular have tend to have a very straight line approach. Government regulation and resources is the first application that they want to apply. They don't really ever will, uh, don't generally accept the idea that the market can provide a solution. They will always then go back to the argument of affordability. So you find yourself being trumped as a decision maker by all the different groups um, <laughs> who will have a straight line solution which maximizes the application of resources to them. <laughs> and even people in the market will argue, you know, get government out of the housing. I mean, it's just these extreme solutions that fail to recognize that they're really part of a very, very elaborate complexity <laughs> and ecology of responses. Um,
in the end, though, it's going to come down to fundamentally this. I mean, duh. <laughs> you have an increasing demand, you'd better have an increasing supply somewhere. And that means change. And the scale of a society that accommodates that change is the only place you will ever find anything that will even remotely approach, approach, approach this concept of a, quote, solution. But don't set yourself up for failure. Don't think you're ever going to meet some kind of standard that just isn't possible in a society like ours and the circumstances in which we exist, given our location, our geography, our demographics, and our expectations.